Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 13th, 2016, and my guest is Judith Donath. She is on the Fellows Advisory Board at Harvard University's Berkman Center for the Internet and Society, and she founded the Sociable, Sociable Media Group at MIT. Her latest book is The Social Machine, Designs for Living Online. Judith, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you. Great to be here. When I recently interviewed Adam D'Angelo of Quora uh, on EconTalk, he mentioned that he had spent a year at the Sociable Media Group uh, and that it focused him on the importance of signaling. How do you see the role of signaling in online identity, and is it it any different than our face-to-face encounters? Um, yeah, so I'm going to just give a little background about what we mean by signaling here. Please. Because it's a little different than sort of the everyday use of this word. Um, signaling theory actually comes from biology. And it's, if you think about how we perceive the world, a lot of what we want to know about each other, we can't directly perceive. Are you nice? Are you going to be nice in the future? Um, do you like me? Instead, we rely on signals, which are perceivable indicators of these otherwise unperceivable traits. However, for the person signaling, it can be profitable to deceive, to say that they're nicer, better, faster, smarter than they actually are. And this, the tension between these two, the, because that can be harm, it's being deceived is harmful. This tension has brought about in the world of evolution, a arms race in communication that has shaped a lot of the animal world. It's shaped a lot of what it means to be human, our culture and technologies. Um, It's particularly important online um, because if we think about how we really make sense of the world, it's not just signals, deliberate communication that we use to make sense of other people, but a sort of broader class of things that in this theory, we'll refer to as cues, but these can be anything. We can, some things are ways people deliberately present themselves, but others, whether it's their way of walking, how they look, their tone of voice, et cetera, maybe things that weren't meant to communicate, but we still pick up on them. Face to face, we see a mix of these two, um, but it's only the signals that are really open to manipul- deliberate manipulation and somewhat by definition. If you do something to deliberately manipulate how others perceive you, then by definition, it's a signal. If you look at how we see what we can see of others online, almost everything is signal. There's, you, you can't directly see if somebody is tall. You only can see if they have written, you know, I am tall or there's a photograph, but it's intended to show them that way. And so understanding the dynamics of signaling is really, really important in understanding how online communities work. Um, A lot of the theory in looking at signaling is about trying to understand, given how profitable it can be to lie or to deceive or exaggerate, what keeps communication honest enough to function? Because if everything was made up and nothing was true, there'd be no reason to pay attention to anything. It wouldn't give you any new knowledge. And so that whole dynamic of how a equilibrium is established that makes communication honest enough to function is the focus of signaling theory and why it's so and that's why it's so important to understand the online world where almost everything is signal and how we design different spaces changes the economics of how reliable they are. Well, let's talk about some of the ways that we signal in face to face. So, I've been thinking about it recently. I I bought a watch, a mm-hmm. very very nineteenth twentieth century thing. I think I guess to do. Uh-huh. And I was aware of the fact. I had to think about it a little bit. That for a man, a watch is one of the few ways that we can signal in a face to face conversation something about ourselves. There's clothing. There's uh, facial expression, but a watch has some information. And of course, 
It may not be honest information. I might decide to splurge and buy a Rolex. I'm not interested particularly in that signal, but some people are. And of course, they do that with other ways uh, as well. They might buy a certain kind of car, uh, live in a certain kind of house. So I'm always thinking in, as an economist about, uh, to some extent, about the way uh, our verbal and visual cues uh, help you identify more things about me. And of course, I can lie. Now, what do we have available online that has the that's the equivalent of that? Because it's it's not obvious at first that there's much that I can signal online. So, what are my what are some of the ways that I can signal online? Well, first of all, um, even in the simplest of interactions, there's the words that you use. So, simply you know what sentence you typed, um, whether what kind of grammar you use, what kind of vocabulary you use, what did you say. Um, what kind of site have you decided to show up on? There's a big difference in what I'm going to guess about you if I've encountered you on a forum for new mothers or in 4chan, which is you know a forum for misbehavior and trolls. Um, there's, especially in sort of today's online ecology, there's all kinds of ways of signaling. If we look at something like Facebook, how many friends you have is a signal, who your friends are, how you respond to them, how you interact with them, whether you use trendy little um, emoticons or whether you write in full paragraphs tells me something about you, what kind of pictures you put up online tells me something about you. So there's an enormous number of ways that we both try to influence how others see us and that give others the fodder to try and interpret what they believe about us. Let's talk about one of the frustrations that I find about online conversation uh, on Twitter in particular, which which I often enjoy and often actually uh, can't believe I'm spending any time on it. Uh -huh. uh, you know, someone will accuse me of signaling. They will say, oh, you say that because, and I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? And in real life, the way I could say, are you out of your mind, the reaction my face makes would tell that other person that they had made a mistake, say. Of course, mm -hmm. that person who wrote that maybe isn't so interested in finding out what I really say. They're just there to poke and make trouble and, and just express themselves in a particular way. And I find myself uh, struggling to be authentic in that uh, arena. Right. So, I mean, one of the things, if I, there's a lot of interesting things in what you just said. One piece is online, a lot of our actions can be for a variety of different audiences. And one of the things that makes online communication very tricky is those audiences are invisible. And Twitter in particular, they're not only invisible, but very confusing. So if you and I and six other people are at a dinner together and you say something, you may be directing it at me, but you're also aware of the other people who are listening and that shapes how you act and what sort of things you might say or, or want everyone to know or versus just me. Um, but we're all, we're all aware of who's there. In some online conversations, you may be aware of who's there, even if you're not seeing them. Something like Twitter, it's incredibly confusing because we all have different sets of followers and people whom we're following. So any kind of conversation is actually between not only people whose audiences are effectively invisible, but everybody's audience is completely different than everyone else's. So it makes for a, a very peculiar way of um, performing. Yeah, I, guess um, I guess it's kind of like walking yeah. into a dinner party and then for the second course, you're in a different room with a different group of people, maybe some overlap, and but the topic hasn't changed and you're still having a conversation. And it's just a little bit weird, I guess, for those of us who uh, grew up in a different it's even place. Weird. Well, it's even weirder than that because it's like being at a dinner party where you, you see a certain set of people, but some of them are deaf. And the people who are actually listening yeah. to the conversation mm -hmm. are listening in through invisible windows because the people you follow aren't the same as ones following you. So it's a, that's a, a particularly strange kind of uh, social dynamic that goes on in Twitter. But the other thing that you said that's quite interesting is you said someone will accuse you of signaling in some way. 
And that's one of the interesting dynamics about signaling, both face-to-face and online, that is just generally interesting because, as I said in the beginning, we read all kinds of information from people, both in, in the, under the umbrella of cues, some of which are signals which they del- deliberately or, in, you know, in some cases in an evolved sense, are meant for communication, and others are things we read from them that weren't meant for communication. And I've said that only signals are manipulative, that's by definition. And so when we don't think something is a signal, when we think it is being done in, as you said, an authentic way, and we tend to conflate the notion of authentic with meaning done for reasons other than signaling, then it's believable because it wasn't done to manipulate. So a lot of how we act, especially when we are signaling something, is in some way to make it appear as if we had other reasons for doing it so that will seem more believable because authenticity are the, we think of authentic as the things that people do for their own sake. And so that's part of the whole um, manipulation process is how can you make things seem like they aren't signals? And a lot of the interpretation is about saying, is this person doing that or saying that or wearing that? because that's how they really are, or are they trying to make an impression? And of course, we're always trying to make an impression some in some abstract subconscious sense. But what I find amazing on Twitter and and I guess sometimes even in real life is someone will accuse me of something, um, being the pawn of some special interest, uh, hating uh, some particular group. And I want to just, you know, yell, you don't know me. And mm-hmm. of course... I know that already. Why do I need to – why do I have an urge? Why would yeah. I think for a minute that despite all that I have written online, written in print, said over the air in this program, why should I be surprised that people don't know me? But it hurts. There's something – and then I watch other people when they're insulted, say, on Twitter, and they respond with this v- v- virulent uh, uh, vulgarity, say, in response to an insult – and I always want to write, drop them a quiet note and say, chill out. You shouldn't mm-hmm. – don't feed the troll. But then I then I notice my urge to do the same. I don't do it most of the time, maybe ever. But but I, the urge is so strong. Uh, and I it just um, – I'm not sure it's a very healthy place. I don't know. Well, I, part of what happens is that online a lot of the cues that – well, a couple of things is one is a lot of the cues that we have about the humanness of others are missing. And so a lot of times people are responding to something someone said and the other people and the audience is very, very disembodied. Face to face, we don't tend to just unleash whatever angry responses we had for a couple of reasons. Some on the better side of our nature is we see the other person, we think, I don't actually want to hurt you. You know, I don't want to cause you harm. Or I can slightly say like, hey, stop it. I see you back off and then we're done. On the other hand, even if we really want to, a lot of times fear will stop us. The realization that if you just tell everyone exactly what you think of them and it's fairly negative, somebody's going to smack you down really badly. Um, online, there's no fear of physical retaliation. So people are can feel free to just unleash their inner angry self. And there's also no sort of social sense of recognition of the humanness of others. So a lot of the bad behavior is because of that. And some of it comes from anonymity, and you point out that there's big gains from allowing anonymity and also some losses. And for me, one of the losses is that I think even when there's no fear of physical response when I know who you are, I think it makes it less likely that you will be um, uh, discourteous or, or, or cruel. Yes. Um, but that phrase, know who you are, is a really interesting mm-hmm. one um, because – and that's part of the – you know, it's a big part of the current debates over real names. Should everything be done under your real name? Should we allow anonymity or should we allow pseudonymity? And I think there's a tendency to kind of fall back on real names and real identity as sort of the easy way of of asking people to be responsible. And it can be appropriate in some settings, but 
simply the fact of knowing somebody's name doesn't actually tell you all that much about them. True. Whereas at some level, what you really, and it, it has other privacy implications. There's certainly a lot of discussions. One of the things that is nice about a more anonymous online world is people can participate in discussions that they don't want everyone who knows them to know that they were in or saying. You can have sort of different facets that way. But on the other hand, you don't want to have conversations with empty ciphers. And so I think one of the pieces that is still very underexplored online is what I've called strong pseudonymity where you have a lot of information about someone, but it's not necessarily tied to who they are in, a, in the real world. But you know what they've said, you know their history, you know their opinions within a particular space. And so you can feel like you've gotten to know them in that context. You may have more information about them, but they retain some privacy. It's funny, names are somewhat overrated, I suppose. Like, you know, the fact that I don't, uh, that I that I think mistakenly that Middlemarch was written by someone named George Eliot, when in fact that was not the author's real name. And in fact, the author's a woman, I -hmm. guess, is um, kind of irrelevant. I know a lot about that author, even though I don't know her real name, uh, or at least I think I do through her book. So in a way, you're right. It's um, something of an illusion, but there's something of an accountability there. Um, Knowing that people know your name, maybe it's the fear that there will be some physical retaliation made possible once the name is known. But I also feel there's a psychological feeling that you've identified yourself and, and stood out in some way. Right. The difficulty is that there are a lot of other forms of retaliation that can come to people through using their real name. You know, and some of the fear is, you know, if you have a discussion group about, you know, some health concerns, is the retaliation going to come through losing your insurance? Right, sure. You know, if you have v- views that are unpopular, are you going to lose your job? You know, you should, I think you friends. should be able to have, <laughs> that, yeah, you should be able to have these t- discussions in certain places um, and not have to have every single forum in which you participate rely on tying itself to who you are in real life and keeping you accountable there because then you end up with people sort of being boxed into just saying very, very bland things about unimportant topics. Well, let's shift gears and talk about uh, a more positive aspect of um, online identity, which is the feeling of at times of being part of a community. So I think a Mm -hmm. lot about about my listeners uh, sitting out there right now listening to this and – there are very limited ways for them to feel they are part of something as a regular listener to the program. So if I do a live event, people will, will come just because they just want to see face to face. They, they want to mm-hmm. see what I look like. They want to see what the guest looks like. They want to they want to thank me uh, or yell at me, whatever the, the case may be. But it's amazing to me how much time we spend online and how mm-hmm. much we crave – uh, brick and mortar, real flesh interaction. And I, I don't think we've done a very good job creating ways for us to interact online. Uh, and I'm curious what your thoughts are as, in your study of design, but do you think there's some sites or some opportunities that are that are waiting out there to improve that? I think some of the impression... Um, is because a lot of the places where people have come to get to know each other very, very well and very intimately are private spaces. But when we sort of go and observe, what are people doing online? We only see the public spaces. And those, you know, it's the same as being, you know, sort of out on a city street. You don't have incredibly close connections to the people sharing those streets with you. So... On the one hand, I think part of what you're seeing about people wanting to be face to face does come in that sense that both there, there's an energy that comes from being with people in the same room. Part of it, I think, is is that sort of cue element that there's just so much we read from other people face to face that we just don't we don't get online. That just being talking to someone and sort of 
seeing eye contact, seeing the minute reactions, seeing how people react to each other. There's so much rich social information in those experiences that relatively little online um, gets close to that. Some of the places I've seen people say, you know, uh, I actually do experience this online, are in game communities where people have been in gaming guilds together and been part of a group and they do raids with others. And there's a lot of activity and behavior and they get to see how someone else acts under dire circumstances. And they say, you know, I like those people, when I met them face to face, I felt like I already knew them that it's, so it's not necessarily just about the design of the interface, but what are the people, how are they participating together? Um, but I also think that in terms of design, there's a tremendous amount of data that exists about other people and how they've behaved and how they've interacted that we make very, very little use of in our design of online spaces. And I think through visualizing some of that, making that information a lot more visible, I think we could create richer spaces that would give us that kind of intuitive sense about who the other participants are that we get when we walk into a room, but we don't when we just start to look at a forum. Of course, one of the challenges is the sitting at that dinner table with 10 people is not the same as sitting in a stadium with 50,000 people. In, in, you really you can't be intimate with 50,000 people. You can't feel those social cues and nuances and facial expressions that you're talking about. And, and inherently, I think we just have a craving – to experience that um, that intimacy and shared experience, and for the, just for the same reason that we go to a movie and movie theater r- rather than just watching at home, uh, there's just something different about it. it. Has a different texture, but it has a much different texture when it's a conversation around a table than uh, back and forth in a comment section. Yes, but I would argue that I think it's going to be possible to make some extraordinary interfaces and. For instance, we, years ago, the social media group, we started doing some work with visualizations of Twitter. And, you know, if you go to that stadium and you look at all those people in the crowd, and yes, you can see what they're wearing and their facial expressions. And I I love sitting around and people watching in a cafe and, you know, in any kind of crowd, because you you can sort of, you start to feel like you can know something. You can make guesses about people. You can imagine you understand some backstory to them. When you think about what you're actually seeing, you're seeing their face, you're seeing their clothes, how does that compare to something like Twitter, where if you sit down to take a look at somebody's Twitter profile, you could see four years of their commentary on all kinds of topics, you know, what they've had to say about all, you know, all kinds of things about politics, about sports, about their breakfast. There's a really rich archive there, but right now it's not in the kind of form that you can take a look and get at a quick glance a picture of that person. And so I think some of the data visualization techniques we need to think about is what is a way of taking that information and making it into a very intuitive profile, um, portrait almost, you know, what, you know, in terms of both the frequency of how they interact, what are the topics that they talk about? Maybe some of it has, you know, and there's all kinds of ways of approaching it. Maybe some of it's how much do they talk about themselves and their breakfast versus how much are they a, sort of policy-oriented, you know, analyst, or do they talk about the weather? Is it slang? Is it, you know, there's all kinds of ways of coloring it. But I think the potential to have, being able to look at, you know, the, say, a thousand profiles on Twitter as a very richly detailed crowd shouldn't be impossible. That's a great point. In fact, I, and I never thought about it before, about how sterile most profiles are. They tend to ask things like where you went to school or what your profession is, mm-hmm. um, how long you've been there. But but the opportunity to say to generate 10 random tweets or my 10 favorite tweets or whatever it is, is would be a much more interesting. Um, right. Or even just sort of a analysis of, of the trends in your tweets. You can have something that would be really rich and nuanced about individuals that way and, you know and something like twitter is a is a nice example it's a public forum people can be anonymous or they can be named as they choose so it's not like you're revealing something secret but it could just be a, an extraordinarily rich kind of crowd watching scene which it isn't quite yet that's true 
in fact, yeah, I mean, for me, the the cafe and the faces going by is just, it's not so much guessing who they are, or what they did, where they're headed, or what they're, whether they're happy or not. It's just a feeling you're part of the human experience and its diversity and richness and bittersweetness. I, I don't know. There's something about a city that mm-hmm. uh, isn't captured by sitting alone in your in your uh, in your room looking at the at your Twitter feed. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think again, you know, coming back to signaling, I think that it is one of the things we we just don't really recognize about how we spend our attention, that it's both that an enormous amount of what we do is signaling, is some kind of way of making a claim about who we are, about what our opinions and attitudes and status and affiliations are. And we're kind of doing that anytime we are out among other people. But it's also that I think an enormous amount of our mental processes really are attuned to reading those signals from others. So it's not just that we're constantly trying to figure out, is this person lying to me or telling me the truth, but that we're just in a sort of constant state of evaluation of the people around us, of of sort of who they are, how do they fit into our understanding of the shape of culture? Um, You know, where do they fit? What, What kind of behavior do we expect from them? Is something we are just naturally very, very attuned to. And so when we're in a situation like a cafe, like that whole part of our mind is just kind of richly buzzing away. Hmm. Yeah. Adam Smith said man naturally desires not only to be loved, but to be lovely. And we talk a lot, that's that sentence a lot on this program and our desire for respect from others and attention mm-hmm. and, and feeling important. And uh, in many ways, the Twitter and Facebook and others uh, appeal to the worst side of us. They encourage us to constantly counter. Did anybody comment on my my post? Did 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 I get uh, some more followers, some more friends, some more likes? And I think it's really there's a an addictive aspect to that that most of us are very aware of, but it's very hard to fight. And sometimes it's probably better just to quote be yourself, um, whatever that means. But what I mean by it right now is just step away from that urge to be uh, noticed, to make an impression, to be uh, thought of as something, whatever it is. Just not worry about it for a while. Well, but it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's actually such a bad side. I think, you know, some of it, it can be bad, but the same, I mean, I spent many years living in New York City, which I love. One of the things I think people find exciting about cities like New York or Paris is that people often take the effort to dress to go out, like that the street is really seen yeah. as a performance space. Yeah. And, Those and are that's just in some ways the same part of the mind that says, I've posted something on Facebook. It's not what I'm wearing. It's is this piece of information that I said, do people find it interesting or provocative or something? How did, how did they react? So instead of choosing, you know, what shoes you're wearing, you're, you're choosing a, some kind of statement. It might be personal, it might be political, but then you, you care about how people react. It's, that's how you are in, in sort of the city of Facebook. You know, it can be distracting, but um, you know, that's how we, figure out that balance and how we figure out the right interfaces. But I think it's a very, it comes from a very similar part of our psyche. That's a great point. I'm just, I've been thinking lately about how judgmental I am uh, and whether that's a, always a good trait. And I think many times it is and many times it's not. And I, but my urge to judge constantly as a human being is, uh, you know, I'm sure it's built in, I'm hard, it's hardwired. Uh, and I have to say, as as a non New Yorker, anytime I go to New York, I'm very aware that I'm not playing by the same rules in dress and, and swagger as the other people there. So it's an interesting. It is a uh, it's a it's a big stage for sure. Right, and then you know, and, and part of it also, I think, is that you know, one of the things also that people forget is that there are you know innumerable sort of different sets of affiliation and status that people work within. And some are places where they're very comfortable or they really care or they are, and they may be, you could 
talk to them and they say, yes, this is a place where I care about how other people think. But we often do end up in places where we're uncomfortable. We feel this isn't where we perform our best or, you know, we don't agree with the mores of the place and we still feel judged. So what can work very well in some circumstances becomes very painful in others. That's a great point. So Ned, uh, two more things about face-to-face versus not face-to-face. Get your reaction, then we'll, we'll go on to a different topic. Because I think about both of these people, you know, I do. we're doing this interview right now over the phone. I'm using Google Voice. You're on your, I think, a landline. At, and yeah, yeah. and um, in the summer, when I'm out in California, I do a lot of interviews face-to-face with a slightly different set of equipment. But uh, it's very different to do face-to-face versus over the phone. And everyone assumes that face-to-face is better because it's more intimate. It's You can see the cues that we've been talking about, the facial expressions. You can read the body language. But in my experience, uh, it's not always true. And it's often the case that over the phone is better. And I've been tempted at times to say, uh, I know I'm 400 yards away from your office, but I'll just call you on the phone instead mm-hmm. of coming face-to-face because we're strangers. You and I have never met. Uh, if I had said, oh, I'm in town, let's do this in a studio somewhere, uh, there's a whole different set of challenges. That's the first thing I wanted to make that observation that as big a fan as I am of human contact, um, I think it's not always the most productive thing. And though I said earlier that I love taping Econ Talk Live and people like coming to it, uh, I think I'm a different kind of interviewer. Uh, when I'm in front of a live audience. And there are many good things about that. And there's some not so good things about it. Um, So I just think it's fascinating how it's not just, oh, you can see the cues. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is being face-to-face has so much information um, that it can make thinking difficult. If you look at studies of eye contact between speakers and listeners, When people are listening, they tend to look at the person they're listening to. It's not that, you know, listening isn't cognitively as hard and they're scanning the other person's face for all kinds of cues about, you know, are you you saying this sarcastically or straightforward or how do you feel or are you leaving something out? But when we're speaking, we tend to, unless we're trying really hard not to, most people tend to look away from the person they're talking to, to a large extent, because looking at another human face and trying to form a coherent sentence, both are too cognitively (laughs) difficult to do at the same time. And so when you're interviewing, there's so much that, you know, even though we think of it as natural, there's so much that goes into being in the presence of another person, and particularly a stranger when you're trying to think, that it can make it a lot harder. That's a great insight. I I really never thought about that part. The part that I'm always aware of is uh, that while you're talking, uh, you might be imagining that I'm listening very closely. And my listeners probably think I am, but sometimes I am. But a lot of times I'm looking down at the clock to make sure that I'm going to get in the stuff I want to get in within a certain time. My mind's racing because I'm trying to figure out, should I respond to that or should I just let her keep going? And other mm-hmm. times I'm looking at my notes thinking, should I move to this? To- I wonder what topic I should go to next. And if we were face to face, you would go, he's not listening to me. So right. I sometimes tell listeners, to, I guess when I'm face to face, if I'm not paying attention to you, don't mind me. But of course, that's a hard thing to, to <laughs> hard advice to follow. Right. Or, you know, even when you're at a restaurant with someone, you need to see what time it is, but they're telling you, like, you have to be somewhere at a certain time, but they're telling you some, you know, very personal story. You think, I can't look at my watch right now. And then you get so distracted thinking about how am I going to look at my watch? I don't want to insult them. I just need to do this. So, yeah, so there's just a lot of rules to -to face-to-face conversation because there's so much to pick up on there. You know, and that was, you know, part of the great belief in, you know, in the early days of online conversation was that, well, because it was text, we wouldn't have to worry about any of this. And we would just see, you know, truly, you know, Mm. deep philosophical thoughts from everyone. But that turned out not to quite be the case. Of course, it takes longer to get to get a glimpse of your phone. So one of the advantages of having a watch is that if the person who's telling you that intimate personal story of heartache, say, looks away and to c- control their right. emotions. You can take, you can get a quick look at your watch that you can't get at your phone. Um, it's a crazy, crazy thing. 
Uh, what about uh, virtual reality? What do you think is is coming there? And you write a little bit about um, massive online games where people bring an avatar to an experience that has very limited emotional content right now. Where do you think that's heading uh, and in particular in, in, in virtual reality generally? Well, a lot of what I had written about um, with avatars, um, and this can play out even more so in virtual reality, is that a lot of what is important is how well matched are the inputs to the behavior of the avatar to what the person is doing. Um, so VR, where you are moving and it may be sensing where you are, it can sense your face and that might be driving an avatar is socially more promising than, you know, some of the earlier systems where you could have a complicated looking avatar, but you were giving it very few of the directions how to look. So, you know, if people think back on some of the early days of, you know, graphical social media where you'd have this avatar and it would be smiling, but that had nothing to do with any emotion you were feeling. So my interest with a lot of graphical interfaces is if you have any visual representation of a person, it's going to express, we're going to read all kinds of things into it. Are those things being put there because they somehow reflect the person it stands for and it, they are deliberate or are they artifacts of the design and misleading? Uh, it reminds me, I'm, I'm not a big emoticon guy, but every once in a while I think, I'm, oh, I'm going to throw one in, say to a text to my children. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something that, say, they've done or said that, that made me happy. So I wanna, I'm going to pick a smiling one. But a smile is not a smile. A kiss may be a kiss, but a smile is not a smile. There, there's so many subtleties, the different kinds of smiles. And I go through the 12 or so or eight, whatever it is on my phone, and then none of them match the kind of smile that I want. So it is a very, uh, it's a subtle thing. Yeah, so that's one of my pet peeves are graphical emoticons, because I, th I think that the original emoticons that were made with like a colon and a parentheses, yeah. So yeah, I think they served a really useful purpose in online communication is that they basically extended um, the set of uh, things like exclamation marks and question marks. No one doubts that you can put an exclamation mark at the end of a sentence and changes how it reads. A question mark changes how it reads. And some of the simple emoticons, I think were very useful for doing that. You could, it could help you understand this is sarcasm or it's meant warmly or I'm trying to express sorrow here. And when in the online communication space where it was, it's really sort of this hybrid between sort of the informality of oral communication and sort of the formality of written things, it was really useful to be, to just have more punctuation. Once you start moving into the graphical world where they are actual faces, then they start being these little beings that you're sticking on the end of the sentence. And the appearance of them is, I think, distracting and distorting. So I think they, that's definitely a step backwards. Yeah, I didn't think about it until now, but uh, someone must have written a PhD dissertation on how punctuation marks have changed over time. Uh, because an exclamation point in 1880 is not an exclamation point in 2016. It's today it can often mean I'm kidding <laughs> or mm -hmm. irony. And, and it, it rare, it can mean enthusiasm, but it not, or excitement, but not always weird. Mm -hmm. Do you think, do you think virtual reality is uh, a big deal or, you know, I had Kevin Kelly on here. We we're talking about, about the phenomenon and he thinks it's, revolutionary. And you no, know, I didn't think enough about it. I thought of it more as a place where people like games would play, but it seems like something very different is coming. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it has a tremendous amount of potential because it can be such a, a rich environment. Um, being immersed in a space is a very, very strong experience. I, you know, I think it's going to be quite a while until we really understand the difference between um, doing VR versus it being sort of just a great big movie. 
Um, and I think in particular, a lot of the interesting pieces will come from the game world because it's about a much, much more abstract experience. I also think, again, personally, I'm more interested immediately in the implications of augmented reality. So in some ways, let Pokemon go and things like that are going to have to say in Google Glasses didn't succeed, but I think it was a little bit before its time. And when we start thinking about having information superimposed on the world at all times, I think that's going to be very, very revolutionary. In particular, if we start thinking about having information superimposed on other people, if you start, if you think about the combination of augmented reality and face recognition, where if you could, you know, walking down the street and anytime you see someone, not only, you know, right now it's like you have this choice. There's the online world where we have some sets of information and face to face where you might, you have rich information at some type, but nothing very specific. The ability to match a person to the vast data that's available about them online, I think is going to have an enormous impact on how our society functions. So if I'm walking down the street, I'm in New York, say, and I'm dressed really well, which is it's obviously an example. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm walking down the street and you come from the other direction and I see over your head through my uh, augmented reality uh, set – uh, the last 10 pictures you've shared, your last five purchases, uh, your last five tweets, uh, who your most popular friends are on Facebook, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. or walking down the streets is not as good, as good an example as sitting across the cafe. Right, in, sitting in, in a restaurant. So instead of just train. saying, wow, uh, that's a uh, – that's a, a great suit that that person's wearing. It must have cost a lot of money and, or or that's really bad color for that person or whatever it is. Instead, I'm going to get this unbelievably rich, in theory, uh, set of information. And it raises an issue that you talk a, a lot about in your book, The Social Machine, which is the role of privacy. So mm -hmm. right now I might be able to find out a – you know, I can – when I Google someone, I find out lots of things about them that – whether they want them sh shared or not, I'm going to find them. I might find their wedding announcement. I might find uh, that their parents, one of their parents has passed away. I might find what they played, what sport they played in high school or in college. So you get that information, not in real time, but it raises the question of how much you'd share. And back to our signaling discussion, how much you'd want to share in that setting in the cafe versus something more intimate. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for now, we could just think it's the public information that's available about people. But, you know, even without getting into, you know, whether you can see my purchases or things we think of as private information, um, our whole notion of what is a stranger will really kind of disappear. But it also means that, the dis for instance, the distinction between those who have extensive online presence and very little presence will be manifest you know, as soon as you see somebody, plus any of the negative information that's available about, about someone, um, it's not necessarily the portrait they would choose to see that you see. You see the portrait that is made by whatever service you subscribe to that scrapes this kind of data about the world around you and presents people from that perspective. So it has tremendous privacy implications. But I also think that um, ultimately desirable or not, it, it's not something people will want to go back from. And so the way we now look back and think, oh my God, how did people, you know, live without running water or bathrooms or electricity? We will look back and think, oh my God, how did people live surrounded by people about whom they knew nothing? It will seem very strange. And they'll, yeah, they'll read Jane Austen novels to try to get a vague idea of what that must have been like. Um, I, when we think about signaling, one example I I think about often is uh, a necktie, which I think of as a signal as to whether I'm paying attention. So, so I know people, I don't wear a tie very often, so I'm not a very good example, but I know people whose ties are grossly out of fashion. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they tend to be older people who, um, 
who just haven't changed their tie collection since they were 30, 40 years old. Now they're 60 or 70 and their tie says, I don't pay attention or I don't care to pay attention. Right. And I think what's interesting about this poten- potential revolution is that the levels and ways in which you can signal that you pay attention, which is which is something people do care about, whether you're hip, whether you're on top of things, whatever you want to call it, uh, is going to have an incredibly expanded uh, array of, of ways of doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think this notion of hip and fashion, which we tend to think of as very frivolous, um, is actually a lot more important in our culture than we recognize because we really do live in a world in which um, access to information is one of the key markers of of status. Uh, um, I mean, wealth is certainly a very important one, but the whole notion of how do you get access to information, how good are you at assessing information um, is a huge amount of how we display who we are and that's really what fashion ultimately is, is it's a, it's a signal of how good, how much access to information do you have and how good are you at parsing the good information from the bad information. And it's not just in the world of clothing. I mean, that's the very obvious one where we think of fashion, but there's fashions in management styles, there's fashions in academic topics. There's fashions in all kinds of things. Slang is a fashion. One way of thinking about Twitter is that it's a, that it's, it's using news almost as fashion. It's true. Where, you know, can you get, you know, the most current story out and, you know, are you willing to take the risk of tweeting something um, in its very early stages when it might be wrong? So, you know, that's where the, the cost of signaling comes from. And so I think you're right that, all of this sort of ability to display how up to date you are is going to continue to accelerate. But as you point um, out, if you're reading a book on your Kindle, you can't signal to people how intelligent or hip or uh, arcane your interests are uh, the way you could with a physical book. And it's just interesting how technology has, has changed that, at least that opportunity in the other direction. But your point about fashion is really, a, I think, a deep one because it, it it's really tangled up with our identities, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not just – certainly many of us – again, I'm not a particularly good example of this, but many people, the, the clothes they wear are part of their – an important part of their identity. Um, there are those of us for whom not caring a lot is an important part of our identity. But on so many other dimensions, the things we wear – and I now I'm going to use that term very broadly – beyond clothing, the things we wear, mm-hmm. meaning are the, the food we eat, the people we hang out with, the topics we follow, the interests we have, the the uh, things we read about, the things we have opinions about, the thing, the hobbies that we indulge in, those are our identity. They're, it's it's everything in, in many ways. It's not just the little, oh, these things are just on the side, just aspects of me. They're me. Right. And, you know, and all of them are to some extent subject to fashion in how, you know, in how you express yourself and, and, you know, which particular foods you like have fashions. You know, it's not just restaurant fashion. Like there's fashion where kale came into style and is <laughs> on its way out of style. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, good riddance, I say. I think it's overrated. Uh, I would ask you about my, um, my 86-year-old father who uh, likes to ask me if he should get involved in LinkedIn or a notebook. Uh-huh. Um, uh, he's not up to date. He does have internet access. He does not have a smartphone. He doesn't have a phone. One of, that's a different kind of statement he's making. Uh, finds it, quote, unnecessary. And as his 61-year-old son, I find it frustrating at times when he struggles to interact with the technology that he has chosen to deal with, so what, you know, say Facebook or web page or whatever it is. Um and I, I'm, I, I look at him, he's, you know, he's, he's 86, I'm 61, and I just sort of assume that I'm going to be like him when I'm 86. It's hard to accept, but that technology will have changed so much that I will ha- it will have passed me by. And I, then I wonder, my children, who can't understand how semi-inept I am, 
Will it pass them by at 61 even, 50, 40? Is, the world, is it that the world's moving so quickly or is it that some people are grown up pre-internet and post-internet? I think it's that the world is moving very quickly I, because, I mean, this is part of, part of what I'm writing about these days is, is a lot about signaling and, and a lot of it is about fashion and signaling. Um, but to some elements of fashion really function as these kind of social gatekeepers and consciously or not, I think a lot of social technologies, I have a 16 year old daughter who is very much into fashion of all kinds. And as I watch her and her friends cycle through technologies, it's both, there's a sense of, I mean, she will not even look at Facebook because it is just too embarrassingly the space of old people. Yeah. Um, you know, and she has a 19 year old brother for whom Facebook is just fine, but that's just, you know, that's <laughs> three years or a generation earlier. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the interfaces also become increasingly opaque or require knowledge of a previous interface so that you just have to understand that, yes, that quadrant of your phone has a certain meaning. There's no particular marker of it. It's just the knowledge that you have. And that's how things like fashion really display, make you display whether you have a particular kind of knowledge or not as a marker of whether you are in a particular group or out or how sort of authentic, authentically in it you are. And so I think a lot of these Social technologies really do have that movement of requiring that you are willing to continuously adapt to the new is what you're displaying by using them. Yeah, it's interesting that's a virtue, right? Um, there, there it's is a feature. It can, be, you know, it depends how you look at it. From the perspective of structuring society, it's a feature. From the perspective of inclusiveness, it's a bug. <laughs> I mean, because it's because it's a burden, right? And um, you know, and, and it's it's similar with language. You know, if you look at you know, if you good example look beyond the interface, but you look at how people use these different technologies, they have on their own developed a lot of mores and languages that are also about: Do you not have the knowledge to perform this and use this language correctly? And if not, that's a marker of your outsiderness. Yeah, it's just not obvious that inclusiveness of that kind is really uh, it that they urge to to be on the inside, whether it's with the latest clothing, fashion, technology, uh, slang, etc. Um, I'm not sure how socially productive that is. Uh, is that was that your point, perhaps, or maybe I missed it? No, I don't think that's my point. I think the urge to be, to both divide the world into in-group and out-group and the urge to be on the in-group is pretty fundamentally part of what it means to be human. Um, that's something you can look into sort of neuroscience research and how our brain reacts to, you know, those we perceive as in or out. Um, there's a lot of plasticity about how we define in-group and out-group. Um, it's quite plastic, but there's, we will we do that constantly, and so that's what an enormous amount of signaling is about: is about claims of affiliation, of being a part of a particular group, whether it's a particular class or social group, or the set of people who are interested in X or are Trump supporters or hate Trump or whatever. Um, and so, I guess what my point with fashion is is that since the development of fashion about 500 years ago, it increasingly is an important, whether you like it or not, it's a different thing, but it's an important marker of in-group and out-group membership in a world where access to knowledge is part of what marks the, those distinctions. Yeah, I guess that's the positive way to think about it. I, I like that access to knowledge thing. On the other hand, I, you know, I feel like you can spend a lot of time wasted. You can waste a lot of time trying to figure out what you're supposed to be wearing or thinking or saying that isn't truly part of human flourishing. But I, I think you're right. I don't think, I don't think there's any, can't put that genie back in the bottle. You just have to make your own choices. Mm -hmm. But I get, I get my dad. Um, I'm sure. And I'll be him God willing in a few decades. Um, but the interesting thing, getting back to your tie 
you know, this is one of the things I find very interesting about fashion, and I certainly see this a lot with my 16-year-old, is this notion called counter-signaling. Yeah. Where if you have this tie, and, you know, right now it's very out of style, um, but you're... I mean, in my case, my old jeans, my 16 year old will wear them. And she's, she's walking around in a pair of jeans from the eighties and her, you know, her goal, her shoe goals for this year are a pair of sandals that Rihanna is promoting Mm -hmm. that look exactly like old lady bedroom slippers. And it's either that or Birkenstocks, all of which on somebody who was not in many other ways signaling I am the height of fashion would mark you as extremely out of fashion. And it's a very interesting way of being able to signal that you are so fashionable you do not have to worry about being mistaken for unfashionable and it cannot be copied. See, that's one of the things since the earliest theories of fashion are that, you know, like the most fashionable have a new fashion and then the next low copy them and then they, the top ones have to change and counter signaling is the uncopyable fashion because if you're not at the height of fashion, you can't copy it because you will just look bad. Yeah. You can, I can't send, I can't send that signal that way. Right. I have to find a, a different way to send it. Yeah. That's, that's very, uh, that's very, that's very cool. Let's go back to privacy for a second. Uh, because mm-hmm. you said something that that I've started to think of as is true, which is you said something like we don't want to go back there or we're not going to go in that direction. It, it strikes me that part of the problem with privacy uh, in its current state is that it's moving in one direction. We're, we're getting less private, which gives people a chance to exploit us, manipulate us, steal stuff from us uh, or you know, change our, our vote, our purchase, whatever it is. And at the same time, it's this incredibly rich world of of customized things for me that I love, uh, and it's hard to imagine we're gonna we're going to give up one to get the other, and it feels to me like we're just going to move to a much less private world. And in fact, again, thinking about my parents, people of that generation, when they see what goes on in our world uh, that they're not so much a part of, it shocks them. And I think in 25 years, what we do to protect our privacy may shock us. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, it I may think, shock them. Uh-huh. Well, it, part of what makes a lot of the privacy discussions complicated is that we also need to articulate, you know, sort of who is invading our privacy because there's privacy from other individuals you know, what do we care, you know, that our peers or, you know, other individual people know about us. There's privacy from corporations. There's privacy from the government. You know, so a lot of it really hinges on who's using it and how do we feel that the information about us might be exploited or harm us versus what are the trade-offs that we get. Because at some level, I think we're also coming from a time of unprecedented privacy. Because if you look, you know, in history, when people lived in much smaller communities, you didn't have, you know, a huge government looking in on you, but your neighbors neighbors. knew. Yeah, your neighbors knew a tremendous amount about you. And so sort of the 19th and 20th century urban life was one where, because so many things had moved to the marketplace. You didn't need sort of a constant web of social connections to get your food or your, you know, to have your house exist. You could just, you know, go to one place, make some money, trade that money for other things and live this very, very private life that really is, I think, from that standpoint, somewhat unique in history. And now we're moving into another unique point where there's, a lack of privacy, but on a very vastly different scale of surveillance, of being watched without necessarily watching others. And so the, a lot of the privacy concerns aren't so much about our connections with other people, but with these much larger groups that, whether it's you know Amazon or Google or the government, 
that are watching us and have the ability to manipulate us. Yeah, power is mm -hmm. is and competition are really central there. And I don't uh, – there are a lot of things I never want the government to have and um, because it doesn't matter how nice they are. <laughs> uh, they are not to be trusted. Pow powerful people are not to be trusted. It's not in our psyche to be trustworthy with uh, power in my – that's my view of history and, and humanity. So I think, yeah, I think it's really different um, – in that your point about across people versus across organizations. Right. Yeah. And for me, my, my concern is more with corporations than with the government. I think partly because if a government goes bad, it doesn't really matter what they know about you. You know, governments have been, have done horrible, horrible things with really little surveillance whatsoever. You know, if they want to strike terror into people, it really doesn't matter if they go after you because they knew something about you or they made it up. They will. So I, I'm less, in some ways, less concerned because it, it seems that the issue there is, you know, is your government for the people or not? And if it's not, privacy or not isn't going to be the crux of making things better or worse necessarily. Um, but the level of commercial manipulation um, that we're dealing with, I think, is a much more immediate threat and one that we haven't really seen before. Yeah, it's so interesting. We, you know, I, I like your point about government in general. Your, your, the first point I like a lot that you don't need a lot of information to to exploit and abuse people. Um, I, I would, but I would push back on on that and and make the observation that. The more they know about us, the easier it will be for them to do other things that they hadn't thought of. It, it's true that mm -hmm. that if you're, you know, the Nazis didn't need a database, they would have liked a database of Jews, but they they made one anyway with primitive techniques, mm -hmm. and now it'd be a little quicker. So that it, it just it's not that important. The, the problem is, is that their ability to exploit uh, pe people, amb fair. yeah, ambitious people who know a lot about us. Um, without competition from others is, is, is a terrifying thing for me. And that's why we're about the government. And I think that's why we're less about corporations because in general they face competition. I think the issue now that even people like me who are free market have to cope with is that on the surface at least, many of the gi corporate giants who know an enormous amount about us, the three obvious ones being Google, Facebook, and Amazon um, – Maybe the competitive environment there is not what it was in the past. I think it could, it could be. It doesn't. I don't think Google is going to last forever, or Facebook, or they could all be, or Amazon. I think they can all be uh, destroyed by competitors. But maybe their ability to use their current positions um, in the face of the actual, the not so much competition of right now is not is worrisome. Mm-hmm. And I think there's something maybe you weren't worrying about, but, um, you know, I think also as getting back to signaling, um, one of the things that I think is going to change over the next decade or so is an increasing number of our interactions are going to be with non-human agents. So it's whether it's chatbots online or, the descendants of Alexa and Siri in our homes, but lots and lots of things that will, to our minds, appear to be appealing creatures that we have an emotional relationship with and respond to in an emotional way, but which are designed to appear as if they have feelings and have a relationship with us, but are really designed for the benefit of the corporations that make them. So I think there's a level of persuasiveness and manipulation that we have not seen before that we will in the next decade. Yeah, but I, it's an interesting point. I, I do think there's a potential for exploitation there. You know, it, it's done now without technology. I, I've used this example before the, the, um, you know, the bank with the slogan, we want to be your friend or some awful mm -hmm. thing like that. Well, they're not your friend. <laughs> they want to be right. your banker and make money off your transactions. 
but it sounds good. And there's nice music playing in the background and, and we have this emotional response. Uh, you know, if there's lots of banks with competition and there's lots of Alexas and series, I like to think that the uh, ones that don't exploit me and that actually do me well are going to be the ones that are going to be more successful. So I, to me, it comes down to whether there's going to be competition in these spaces and we'll see, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, or, you know, or the same technology as it becomes um, more a part of how our government is elected. What do you mean? Well, right now, um, you know, some of the mailings that you get are, um, are directed to you, but you don't get a completely different message from every candidate. So as it becomes a lot easier to, one, be conversant with, you know, things that aren't necessarily human but are very good at persuading you um, and can talk to you and, you know, say, well, this is, you know, this is what I support. I think there's just a, a level of, of artificial camaraderie that will be much more influential in a, a number of realms. Well, I think that's true. And why, why don't we close with this? I mean, I, I think you and I like to people quote like us like to think about these things, and we like to think that we're sophisticated. And I won't include you. I'll just talk about myself. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I like to think of myself as as quote sophisticated. I, you know, I'm sensitive to these things. I know about when I'm being manipulated. I don't. You know, I know that Siri's not a person. I don't have any emotional ties to her. But I think – and then the question is, but there might be other people. They're going to be susceptible to this. Uh, so are you optimistic that we could encourage lots of us to be – understand these these powerful techniques? Or are you respectful of everyone's ability to do it? Are you optimistic? Or do you think actually that none of us can do it? We're just fooling ourselves and we're all susceptible to it. I think we are all susceptible to it. And I think that – the attempt not to be susceptible is dangerous in itself because, you know, do you want to harden your heart against anything that appears to be vulnerable? You know, it's a, a little creature and it's in your house and it's like really disappointed that you don't actually want to buy those jeans it suggested for you, you know, but, um, but trying to be too, too cynical or, or to say, you know, that you are closed to emotional manipulation. Does it close us to the emotional interaction between us and other humans or other animals that actually have real empathy and feelings? So how to keep that balance is going to be tricky. My guest today has been Judith Donath. Judith, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, thank you. This has been fascinating. I agree. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>